Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Professor Gaeta's lecture at Abralin Ao Vivo Linguists Online. I hope that all of you attending the event today are healthy and safe. I am Vitor Nobrega. I'm a linguist and currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Laboratory for Human Evolutionary Studies at the Biosciences Institute, University of Sao Paulo. I'm a morphologist with great interest in, evolu in evolutionary linguistics. Let me begin by thanking Abralin, especially Abralin's president, Professor Miguel Oliveira Jr., and Abralin Vi Abralin's vice president, Professor Raquel Freitag, for making this event possible. And on behalf of Abralin and of my fellow linguists in Brazil, I would like to thank Professor Gaeta for kindly accepting our invitation to collaborate with this project. It's an enormous, ple enormous pleasure to have you remotely with us today. Abralin ao Vivo Linguists Online is an international initiative in cooperation with the Comité Internacional Permanente de Linguiste, the Asociación de Linguística y Filología de América Latina, the Sociedad Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, the Asociación de Linguística Aplicada do Brasil, the Asociación Internacional de Linguística Aplique, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Sociedas Linguística Europea, the Australian Linguistic Society, the British Association for Applied Linguistics, and the Sociedad Española de Linguística. This afternoon, Professor Gaeta will be exploring ways for integrating the conceptual pair of so-called adaptations and exaptations from evolutionary biology into the current linguistic epistemology. He will claim that adaptive changes are characterized as responding to a general design of economy and plasticity, while exaptive changes result from refunctional refunctionalization of partially pre-adapted linguistic material. On the basis of this theoretical background, the issue of possible fossils dig out in, in our historical languages will be discussed. Livio Gaeta is full professor for German linguistics at the Dipartimento di Studi Humanistici of the Università di Torino. He has participated in several research projects as main principal investigator, such as the Prim project, the Climb Alp, Corpus Linguistics Meets Alpine Cultural Heritage, Documenting and Safeguarding Linguistic Minorities in the Alps, and ARC Walls, a digital archive to preserve in the cultural and linguistic heritage of the Walser communities in Italy. He has constantly participated in national and international congresses and has been given, has been invited to give lectures by several international universities and research centers. His main research interests include morphology and word formation, theoretical approaches to language change, construction grammar in theory and practice, and language contact and grammaticalization. Now, let's enjoy Professor Gaeta's lecture on adaptations, exaptations, and fossils, evolutionary perspectives on language. After his lecture, he'll have up, we'll have up to 30 minutes of questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hope so. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I hope it's, uh, uh, you can hear me. Uh, I will start my my class sharing my video uh, and because I will use a PowerPoint, uh, well, PDF presentation actually, and that's it. Okay. So uh, as uh, Vitor has said, I will give a talk on adaptation, acceptations and fossils, evolutionary perspectives on language, in which I will try to uh, give you an idea of what I mean by uh, using this terminology in linguistics and especially in historical linguistics and what kind of perspective can be opened uh, using this uh, concept of all this uh, conceptual uh, domain, uh, especially with regard to the idea of reconstructing kind of proto-language and which also have uh, has to offer us some fossils as, uh, as the uh, how can they can they be defined? Um, actually, on evolutionary dimensions in languages, uh, we can uh, actually have two different perspectives. The one, the first one is uh, the so-called evolutionary linguistics. You can also have a Wikipedia page on that, which is mainly concerned with the origin of language uh, in terms of prehistoric reconstruction, especially relying on biological evidence, so working with paleontologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I will rather be on the second uh, side, on the second perspective, namely more, broad, uh, more broadly evolutionary perspectives, which uh, relate, uh, which aims at uh, adapting some uh, new uh, epistemological uh, domain to language change and evolution, uh, trying to uh, discover dynamics and mechanisms of language evolution and change, 
especially focusing also on proto language as the initial stage of language evolution. In this, uh, by in this uh, second uh, perspective, I would say second line of research, I would say, uh, what is at the uh, core of the enterprise is to uh, use concept and method and methods developed in evolution biology, which can provide in innovative perspective on the issue of language evolution and change, especially uh, adapting such evolutionary perspective will allow allows us to project language change on the long line of evolution from a so-called stage nil, stage zero, where proto-language started with subsequent prehistoric and historical development. I refer you to work, to seminal work by Van Heine and Elena Kuteva. Uh, this can also be crafted in terms of a kind of paleontologist trip uh, to uh, refer to a, fam a, a famous uh, paper by Tolmy Givon, uh, who, uh, and in this paleontologist trip, we, which uh, we could also try to discover fossils and relics of proto-linguistic structures. And I will try to, uh, will try to offer you one example of such a, a fossil. But let's come first to the uh, to the first part of my contribution, namely the uh, the usage, the introduction of uh, the term, the, the uh, conceptual uh, pair uh, exaptation adaptation in linguistics. As you might know, uh, in a groundbreaking contribution, Roger Lass suggested the adoption of the term exaptation with two basic failures. Uh, the first one is functional renewal, which corresponds actually to, to this uh, uh, to this employment in evolution biology, and this functional renewal consists in the reuse of already extant grammatical material for new purposes. Uh, the second uh, the second value of the term uh, is. Uh, relates to the fact that uh, this must be conceptually coupled with the idea that the morpheme at stake must have been already there, but either serving some other purpose or serving no purpose at all. But for this reason, acceptation has been, has been seen as the reuse of junk, namely grammatical garbage deprived of any function, although, although uh, it has been uh, admitted that, in fact, uh, acceptation does not presuppose emptiness of the acceptato, huh? as last in this second uh, book uh, in this book of 97, which he also discusses at length, acceptation uh, actually recognizes. Uh, since the first uh, introduction of uh, acceptation in uh, linguistics, uh, it has been, the term has been uh, opposed or used as a counterpart of grammaticalization. And here I'm referring to a paper of Nigel Vincent, 95, in which Vincent uh, uh, assumes that the distinction of the grammaticalization acceptation regards the different impact on the system. Namely, in the process of grammaticalization, the morpheme develops a function which is new relative to the grammatical system, as Vincent says, while acceptations involve the assignment of new morphosyntactic functions to elements which are already centrally part uh, of the grammar. I will not give you any example here. Uh, we'll leave it in the background because I am rather uh, concentrated on the epistemological or the conceptual part of this uh, of this uh, discussion. Uh, this is the schema drawn from from uh, from uh, Vincent. Actually, after Vincent's paper, a certain debate uh, has been developed on the idea that. Uh, basically, grammaticalization displays is understood in terms of clients, as you might know, and these clients uh, profile uh, profile kind of vertical orientation in which something moves up and down the client. Uh, here I quote again from Vincent: "Changes catalogued under while acceptation is not related to a client, so doesn't display any vertical orientation." So Vincent says changes cataloged under the rubric of acceptation involved to coin a term, the regrammaticalization of a particular morphological marker rather than its continuation down the grammaticalization path on which it was historically embarked. Joseph, Brian Joseph also uh, added to this uh, understanding of grammaticalization in terms of client as a vertical orientation, the idea that there are other changes which are not to be connected to the grammaticalization which rather present some kind of lateral shifts. Uh, namely movement that goes laterally on the client, not up or down it. So we can 
uh, understand that uh, while, ag uh, while aggregatization as a kind of vertical orientation, acceptation or whatever is not grantization, uh, display kind of horizontal orientation. One might ask, and I've been uh, often asked actually, uh, what is actually, why is acceptation or why should be considered acceptation relevant for linguistics? What is the advantage of importing terms and concepts from such different disciplines as evolution and biology, in which the object of investigation is clearly different, ontologically as well as empirically? This objection appears particularly justified with the kind of role played by consciousness and intentionality in language and communication, which is normally discarded in evolutionary biology under the assumption that this would bring an intolerable degree of teleology into the explanatory picture. However, in normal conditions, the speakers don't consciously act to change their own language. I refer you to uh, work by Rudy Keller back in the 90s, uh, in which he showed that uh, the, 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 the speaker's intentions are completely immersed within a social dimension, which is to be evaluated in terms of more or less successful communicative exchange. So speakers don't aim at change their language, they aim at communicating. In other words, language change results indirectly from language use. This is the crucial reason why language change cannot be opposed to evolutionary biology because of its alleged intentional nature. Um, I will come back to this issue when I will uh, discuss the Lamarckian position uh, contrasting with the Darwinian position. Uh, in my mind, the debate on acceptation and, and the introduction of acceptation linguistics has suffered from a theoretical and epistemological shortcoming. The term, in fact, has been borrowed isolatedly without considering the whole conceptual taxonomy to which it belongs in evolution and biology, where it forms a strict conceptual pair with adaptation. Unfortunately, the term that adaptation has been used in linguistics in several disparate ways and completely disregarded by those who have animated the debate on acceptation linguistics. I will not review this. I will not review this number of different usages, but but in fact, no one has really connected acceptation with adaptation uh, as in the way as it has been uh, done in evolution biology. I, mean, I want just want to refer you to this nice Jacobson's quote in which he observes that the adaptive nature of communication in its multiform varieties involves two correlated genera, self-adjustment to the environment and the adjusting of the environment to the one's uh, own needs. Indeed, it becomes one of the most exciting biological problems. And again, mutatis mutandis, it is also a vital concern of present day linguistics. This, this is something which Jackson wrote back 1971. But I think it's very actual. Well, in, the crucial point is that in evolutionary biology, acceptation, its dynamic counterpart, acceptive change, uh, I will rather, uh, I, I, I will use this. Uh, term acceptive change instead of acceptation because I think it's more adequate for what we have uh, in mind. Uh, this uh, form a minimal conceptual pair with adaptation of adaptive change, uh, at least according to the original Gould and Verba uh, proposal. The main difference between adaptive and acceptive changes resides in their origin. Adaptive changes result from a casual genetic variation giving rise to the mutation of a a feature of an organism which subsequently undergoes adaptive selections. Those organisms which display the causal uh, mutation survive because they are better equipped than those not displaying the mutation. So the final result, the mutated organisms are normally said to have been adapted to the surrounding environment. This latter formulation can give rise to Lamarckian interpretation of the facts, whereby the mutations are meant to improve the survival chances of the organisms. This strongly theological view was already criticized by Darwin, where he refused explicitly, explicitly any sort of teleology and pled for a metaphorical interpretation of the struggle for life intended as the selection of the best defeat. Accordingly, the selective advantage of mutated organisms has to be measured in purely quantitative terms without any reference to the cultural or intentional dimension present in Lamarck's idea that mutations follow the more or less conscious intention of fitting the environment better. Acceptive changes present the co-optation or refunctionalization of mutation to serve a different goal with regard to its original function. 
As a result, the mutated organisms can be said to have been adapted to the surrounding environment insofar as their mutation has been refunctionalized. Thus, the me mechanism of adaptive selection acts twice in the case of acceptation. Firstly, when the causal mutation appears favoring the mutated organisms, as in the so-called pre-adaptation. And secondly, when the causal mutation uh, is reused for uh, casual mutation, sorry, for a different goal favoring those organisms which display the refunctionalization. The reuse has to be interpreted in metaphorical terms. No teleology is implied, but simply the selective advantage of mutated organisms displaying the accepted, namely refunctionalized trait over the others. Under acceptation, two different subtypes are included, pre-adaptation and so-called span groups. Pre-adaptations, already envisaged by Darwin, result from a mechanism whereby, and I quote from a resumptive or important paper by a biologist Bock, 1959, a structure is said to be pre-adapted for a new function if its present form, which enables it to discharge its original function, also enables it to assume the new function whenever need for this function arises. Pre-adaptations represent, in this view, a certain intermediate type between adaptive and adaptive changes. On the other hand, spandrels provide instances of pure recycling of biological material to serve a different purpose because they are intended as the byproduct of the evolution of some other characteristic rather than a direct product of adaptive selection relating to a certain organ. In other words, spandrels do not necessarily display a pre-adaptive character. And this is the main difference between these two kinds of adaptive changes. The mechanism of natural selection shared by the adaptation and acceptation provides the dynamic part of the evolutionary scenario which determines the survival of the mutated organism in contrast to the non-mutated one. The main difference between adaptation and acceptation resides in the crucial role played by the pre-adaptation which gives the mutation a theological flavor which is absent in the case of the adaptation, as if the pre-adapted material would have to follow some kind of teleology, but this is not what actually Darwin meant. In order to import the term into our linguistic epistemology, one has to be conscious of the starting point. Acceptation is inherently connected with the adaptation. The former cannot be understood without the latter. Uh, final word in evolutionary biology on uh, Lamarckian teleology. Darwin explicitly refused any teleological misinterpretation, although recognized the ambiguous and to a certain extent metaphorical value of his terminology, because the usage of expressions like adaptation, natural selection, might in fact envisage an intentional agent behind the observed phenomena, which, which, which was never meant to be the case by Charles Darwin. Actually, Anderson, Annie Anderson, uh, criticized this ambiguous terminology as the source of the distorted use made in the current epistemological debate, these terms within and outside evolution and biology and especially in linguistics. On the other hand, the metaphorical potential terminology coined by Darwin, which by the way is also benefited, benefited from the influence of other disciplines such as demography and economy, has surely attracted scholars from different disciplines with the aim of reaching their own concepts of the ground. Therefore, this ambiguity, and this ambiguity has brought about a positive cross-fertilization among different research fields, which should not be forgotten. So I would not treat this metaphorical uh, the background or this, uh, this metaphorical allure uh, uh, in the terminology found by Darwin as a negative factor, rather a positive one. So if you want to import acceptation into linguistics, you also have to find a collocate, theoretical collocation for adaptive changes. And this is what I am, I aim to do now, intending language as a complex adaptive system. And in this, I will follow several recent proposals for such an understanding, especially the one by Beckner and collaborators, in which they claim that uh, such intending language as a complex adaptive system uh, means that uh, the following properties have to be uh, considered. Namely, the system consists of multiple agents, the speakers in the speech community interacting with one another, Second, very important for our purposes, the system is adaptive. That is, the speaker's behavior is based on their past interactions and current and past interactions together feed forward into future behavior. We'll come back to this point, which is crucial. Third property, a speaker's behavior is the consequence of competing factors ranging from perceptual mechanics 
uh, to social motivations. And finally, the structures of language emerge from interrelated patterns of experience, social interaction, interaction and cognitive processes. Uh, let's try to model all of this in language change. And I report you this uh, famous uh, picture uh, uh, fine, uh, uh, um, sketched by Henning Anderson back in the 70s, in which he spoke uh, of language change in terms of uh, abduction. Uh, from grammar one, the grammar two, is abducted by means of the output uh, heard by the speakers uh, who developed grammar too. Uh, we will try to extend the use, this picture extending it to adaptive selection along the line sketched by Lindblom and collaborator. Cultural and organic evolution share the same fundamental element. They are both products of a process of selection from a variation, the presence of biasing con constraints. Forms compatible with constraints stand in a better chance of being selected than those that do not. This is the crucial point. Selection uh, take place here, actually, this point at the output one. And we will develop a sociophonetic adaptive view, namely phonetic forms are put to both articulatory and perceptual tests by speakers, listeners, and that in a significant way, such evaluation determine the phonetic shape of sound patterns. How uh, does it uh, happen? Uh, well, at the heart of the sound change, as um, several authors have proposed, for instance, Ohala, uh, uh, misperception have to be considered. Namely, the speaker misperceived the speaker of the grammar two, misperceived the output one, and produced output two, which is different from the, which contain a structural change, which correspond, which do not correspond, does not correspond to grammar one, and uh, configure a, a change in the grammar two of the second speaker's mind. Uh, but the point is that, and this is the where the uh, uh, the criticism of uh, Lindblom and collaborators uh, uh, sets in, is that if a listener should decide to pronounce a word that she has misperceived, she could not so unless she knew what that word was. This is the crucial point. So mis misperception happens all the time. That's true, but why they lead to language change, and why are, are they not corrected? And in order to answer this, Lindblom uh, provides a number of scenarios. Namely, first, misperception has to be only partial, a kind of mini sound change, in the sense that lexical access occurs successfully despite a phonetic error. So, in fact, speaker two uh, uh, actually understands what speaker one wants to say, uh, in spite of the mini uh, sound change, the misperception in the output one. Second, if misperceptions are partial, errors will be corrected immediately or recognition, by recognition. Hmm? Thus, in the crucial moment in which the listener turns to speaker, so produces the, the output two, she has to decide whether to keep the error or simply restore the correct form. In the adaptionist model, which is suggested by Lindwell and collaborators, the talker, talkers can focus either on what is being said in a content and knowledge dependent mode, the so-called so -called what mode, or on how something is said in a signal oriented mode, the so-called how mode, especially when the reference to the contextual knowledge is somehow inhibited. It's the second mode that provides the breeding ground for new pronunciation, mini sound changes. Misperception are then to be tempered by a mechanism deciding whether they are to be adopted or not in the subsequent production. Such a mechanism, a mechanism implies that native speakers store in their phonetic memories not only lexical motor perceptual information on the canonical, what is expected should be pronunciation of each item, but also relatively unprocessed phonetic patterns captured in sporadic moments of acoustic auditory truth. And two possible scenarios can be imagined for a change, namely whether either modulation by signal independent formation is somehow inhibited or becomes superfluous because intelligibility demands uh, have 
already uh, intelligibility demands have already been redundantly satisfied or are of secondary importance for social or speaker related physiological or cognitive reasons. In this latter case, the how mode becomes, becomes of crucial importance, allowing the B speaker to reconstruct output one and to produce her own output two on the basis of the condition of the entire cognitive situation which she is located. So, the talkers are aware of the should be pronunciation at the same time of the range of phonological processes that are normally controlled during the communication process. Uh, the speaker, uh, the talkers, then decides where, whether to keep the, pro, the mini sound change or not. This is the, the crucial idea. And in this sense, Lindblom and, and, and collaborators suggest a model which the ideal speaker makes a running estimate of the listener's need for explicit signal information on a moment-to-moment -moment basis and then adapts the production of the utterance elements, words, syllables, phonemes to those needs. So crucially, the point is that the speakers has two modalities, the what mode and, and the how mode at disposal and decides whether, adopt, whether to adopt the mini sound change or not depending on the contextual the environment situation uh, uh, and all variables contained in the environment. This model responds to the general cognitive requirements of plasticity and economy, which are necessary for the production of sufficiently informative signals by action systems. The continuous modeling and adaptation of the signal takes place along a continuum which more forcefully hyper articulated forms at one hand and less energetic hyper forms at the other. Uh, so this of course applied to sound change. This H and H theory, besides giving a principal account of the origin and of the phonetic variation, is at the heart of the how mode seen above, because it attempts to explicitly determine what the speaker's assumption is about the informational needs of the listener and how a own tested demand for articulated simplification has to be satisfied when a given phonetic form is produced. So elements of this adaptation adapt the adaptationist model are social value of the new diverging replications. Hmm? So uh, the adoption of a certain variant by a social group can be extended new speakers as a signal of their solidarity with the group. By doing so, they increase their social fitness and signal their status and identity to outsiders. In this sense, the change can be considered adaptive with respect to social variables. This usage of, adapt of the adaptive is actually pretty common in social linguistics, but I will not come back to, will not uh, uh, spend more time on this. Second point, the structural complexity, uh, in terms of, of course, articulatory, but also articulatory, articulatory effort. And third, perceptual distinctiveness or salience, as we can, as we can call it. Uh, adaptive changes are characterized by the last, by these last two aspects, insofar as they are meant to foster a dialectic balance across the additional costs resulting from the frequency or the structural complexity, for instance, the length of an expression on the one hand, and the extravagance of its perceptual benefits, the salience, the community efficacy, on the other. It's precisely the relevance of the speaker's listeners' evaluation resulting from their more or less conscious confrontation of this dialectic between energy saving and distinctiveness or salience that shapes in adaptive sense their linguistic behavior. So this is the adaptive interpretation of change. So this dialectic between uh, economy uh, or evaluation of economy uh, of en uh, between energy saving cost and salience, so efficacy of uh, communication. Uh, adaptive changes in phonology are there uh, more or less uh, and uh, uh, are more or less also been discussed by Lindblom. Uh, nice thing is that if if you look at Lindblom's and collaborators' paper, uh, then you uh, can uh, see that they uh, intend number of sound changes, sound changes coming from phonological processes of being of adaptive nature, which actually correspond to the more to the to, to, to the main kind of phonological processes uh, uh, leading to mod modeling the phonological system of the of the world's languages. Uh, I can refer you to review to survey by Donegan Stamp or Kiparski. 
They are weakening processes like assimilation, vowel reduction, vowel reduction, consonant deletion, or, or, or strength on the one hand, on the other hand, strengthening processes like polarizations, vowel shifts, uh, etc., and consonant formations, aspiration, etc., affrication, and, and so on, and so on. These phonological processes are expressly oriented as they obey well-defined functions and goals to which the speakers adapt their behavior during the speech act. On the other hand, the upper teleology, represented by the reference to terms like strengthening or weakening, is to be uh, downplayed by the observation that variations during the process of replication are few, few, fully casual. Hmm? As Lindblom and, and collaborators put it, assimilations just happen all the time. The kind of pandemic diffusion, and I use pandemic not, uh, not casually here, and the probability of being retained can be partially predicted on the basis of language specific parameters like word frequency, articulatory complexity, the so called science principle, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can refer, uh, refer you to uh, further, further literature on phonology by Lindblom, Madison, et cetera, et cetera. Let's move outside of the phonology uh, and try to adapt Lindblom's and collaborators' uh, model to changes uh, coming from other domain and especially from grammaticalization, which we have seen to be kind of counterpart of typical exaptive changes. Let's see how we can model this adapt, uh, 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 model grammaticalization in terms of adaptive change. Uh, Grammaticalization results from the speaker's intention of increasing their community efficacy and or to reach certain goals within a speaker's com uh, community. This has been repeated several times in the literature. I, I find Martin Asma's paper of 1999 uh, uh, really illuminating on this uh, insofar as he suggests a number of ecological conditions which provide an optimal base for an adaptive understanding of grammaticalization. These ecolog ecological conditions highlight the process of evaluation that the speakers, listeners carry out when they are immersed in concrete speech situation. And they are uh, summarized in three uh, points. Grammar is understood in terms of a processing device according to which linguist units are ordered along, along a continuum from maximally free uh, to maximally rule bound. Certain meanings of linguistic units are universally much more basic to speaking than others, and therefore are likely to become entrenched much more often. Hmm? High frequency leads to greater ease of processing, and therefore to routinization or automation, which require less attention during the execution. This is the entrenchment part. These ecological conditions constitute the background for the colonization process, whereby the employment of certain salient, namely communicative, communicatively effective constructions, gives rise to a concrete evaluation of a newly created structure in accordance with the maximum of action underlying the speaker's behavior. Uh, let's look at the upper maxim, talk in such a way that you are socially successful at the lowest possible cost. And and the other and the other should be familiar to everybody, the maximum of clarity, economy, conformity, and especially extravagance. Talk in such a way that you are noticed. If the social reaction is positive, this leads to a process of erosion of the construction due to its increased frequency and routinization, which complies with the cost saving as strategy. Uh, Concretely, take the Italian progressive form sto andando. I'm going, literally, I stay going. Hmm? Simply relying on the what mode should lead to this mystic construction because no, no compositional reading is allowed. You cannot stay and go at the same time. However, the focus on the how mode triggers the listener in the, uh, in the listener the activation of the whole series of bridging contexts which permit a meaningful interpretation that can be subsequently repeated if the result is favorable. Sto a casa, I stay at home, sto a lavoro, I stay at work, sto lavorando, I stay working, and sto andando, I stay going. This also accounts for the phenomenon of persistence layering in which the new function coexists with the old one, because this requires a double access in terms either of the what mode or of the how mode, depending on the linguistic context, the surrounding community conditions, etc. etc. On the other hand, structural complexity is increased by the birth of a cohesive preprocess and of a new inflectional category of the verb, namely progressive form. 
Moreover, the typical inf inflationary effect of capitalization, whereby an initially effective construction undergoes routinization and subsequently loses its commutative advantage as long as more speakers use it, it I refer you again to Hasbrath and also to Ostendahl book uh, of 2000, 2000, 2000 uh, also has an adaptive explanation due to the dialectic between the what and the how modes and to their connection with the general requirements of plasticity, uh, salience, and economy. Finally, an adaptationist view of granularization nicely accommodates the nature of granularization in terms of third type phenomena uh, uh, adopted by, suggested by Keller in his 94 book, namely kind of invisible hand phenomenon. Uh, uh, which is explained if it can be shown that to be the casual consequence of individual actions that realize similar intentions. Uh, it's important to stress that in this way, no appeal to Lamarckian technology is necessary. Similar to some change, meaning ex extensions simply happen, generally via metaphors or metonymies, as in the case of French near future base on aller to go, uh, je vais dormir, I go to sleep, I'm falling asleep, je vais sortir, I'm going to go out, I'll go out, which is even extend to aller with a dramatic, a dramatic effect of, for the what and the how modes. Je vais aller, I go, go, actually, which, which means a plan to go, I'll go. Hmm? This also reveals the pandemic nature of globalization, similar to the pandemic nature of Pathological processes like weakening or strengthening, etc. And this is what I, I already I proposed in earlier works uh, as the funnel-shaped nature of granularization, interpreted here as an adaptive change. So the idea is that you have here lexemes uh, having a lexical meaning, enters the funnel, and what you find at the end are grams, you know, so abstract meaning, etc. Grammatization is largely unidirectional and follows well-defined chains or paths along which certain grammatical properties cluster around transaction with family resemblance. And I list you here a uh, number of properties which characterize grammatization in the standard literature on that, namely bleaching, erosion, verticality in this sense, uh, in the sense of funnel-shaped uh, uh, nature, Multiple paths, meaning that uh, not necessarily stay becomes a copula, but it can it can also become something else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Pervasiveness or pandemic, uh, unpredictability, irreverse, irreversibility, layering, persistence, and irrationality. So we have adopted this adaptionist, adaptionist model. Uh, for grammaticalization, and in fact, it turns out that grammaticalization can be very well interpreted in terms of a model in terms of an adaptive change. What about acceptive change? They do not have to be assumed at not responding to the requisites of adaptive changes consisting in the ecological conditions which profile economy and plasticity. In this sense, they should not; they are expected to be not oriented, namely. They either cannot be reduced to the typology of strengthening and weakening processes found in the phonology or do not follow the funnel shaped path typical of granularization, thereby lacking a more general motivation in terms of economy or plasticity. For this reason, they may appear as guided by certain bricolors craft, as Roger last suggested, because they do not seem to respond to a general design, nor are they. Uh, 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 are they uh, likely, sorry, for the misprint, the result, uh, to result from common processes which may become routinized under certain conditions. Propose, what kind of acceptive changes can we assume? First one, to stay within phonology, tonogenesis in Mandarin uh, Chinese. This is related to the, the tonogenesis is related to the deletion of syllable final or lingual consonants, which are still preserved in modern cognate varieties such as Cantonese and Hakka. Uh, this is based on a common allophonic phenomenon, namely the occurrence of F0 perturbation of the consonants, which are normally not perceived as speech difference, but as qualitative features on the consonants. For instance, a T with lowered phi zero, F0 will sound more like D than one with raised F0. However, the F0 perturbation can be misperceived as a pitch. 
when syllable final consonants happen to be weakened as a consequence of an adaptive change, the lowering, uh, in the case or, of, of H, or raising, in the case of the glottal stop, effect can be refunctionalized to express something else, namely the meaning distinction, distinction in minimal lexical pairs. And this is the, 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 the uh, acceptation, the acceptive change, uh, namely a typical weakening process, namely an adaptive change, is exempted uh, for something else, for a new function, namely lexical distinction. Note that this F0 perturbation may be seen as pre-adapted for the subsequent tonogenesis. Such a sort of pre-adaptation is held responsible for the refunctionalization of the allophonic F0 perturbation, which should have disappeared after the weakening process. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this term doesn't imply a strictly theological a teleological view as if this F0 perturbation were predestinated for acceptation. Darwin's intuition underlying the term pre-adaptation relates to the fact that this explains why a certain structure has become dysfunctional or functionless, has been kept and refunctionalized instead of being simply dismissed. Pre-adaptation emphasizes that vestiges of the new possible function were already present to a certain extent in the structure. It's in this sense the term pre-adaptation is used here. Hmm? Uh, and again, no reference to any kind of Lamarckian or Lamarck style teleology has to be assumed. Let's move to morphology uh, for another example of acceptive changes, plural markers in Italian. A set of Italian nouns select two different plural markers associated with different gender values on the base of a clear semantic differentiation. I refer you to work by Anna Giacolone Ramat. Classical example, membro, member, has two plurals, membri, members, and membra, limbs, uh, with kind of collective value. Again, this is true for osso, bone, ossi, bones, ossa. Uh, and the funny thing is that this also and membra display feminine gender. Uh, and also means the whole uh, set of bones, for instance, of the skeleton. Uh, what we uh, uh, can assume then is that the old plural marker A of the Latin neuters has been accepted to convey a quite specific meaning, generally referring to a cohesive aggregate and extended to other stems like this is the important part, like muro, uh, uh, which display uh, displays nowadays in Italian two plurals, namely muri walls and mura walls, for instance, of a town with a collective value. The important thing is that murus in Latin uh, was not neuter, so did not, uh, uh, did not dis display this a uh, plural. Uh, another interesting example of acceptive change is uh, drawn from uh, long in, uh, from Romanian, the long infinitives, which is an interesting case of move from inflection to derivation. Very much in the light of the of the bricolage nature of acceptive changes, uh, who, who, which do not care uh, about directionality. Mm -hmm. The long infinitive found in Romanian. Uh, go back, uh, goes back clearly to the old Latin infinitive, and as in exprimere. Hmm? Nowadays, they are typical action nouns, sensitive to the properties, to the, the sensitive like all action nouns to lexical properties, lexical factors like lexical blocking or pluralization, etc. Uh, so, for instance, from amuri, you don't find Murire because of the existence of muerte. Hmm? And on the other hand, uh, uh, an action noun like cantare, uh, cantare, singing song, displays a plural uh, uh, cantari, hmm? etc., uh, which was not possible in, in the case of the infinitive in Latin and in many other Romance languages, with small exceptions. An example drawn from syntax refers to word order, basically. Mm, namely, for instance, development of verb second in German. I, 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 I rely here on work by Roland Hintels and, 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 uh, and collaborator. Uh, the verb second pattern found in modern German, in which the second position of the verb in the clause signals the initial position occupied, occupied by the topical constituent, 
was initiated, uh, according to Interhertzl and collaborator, by about net topics in sentence expressing subordinated discourse relation as in the constraints observed in the following one and two sentence, old high German sentences. Warum do hier in der Landskäfe, where the shepherds in that region, with initial sentence, contrasting, which is all, uh, which is all new, doesn't contain topic, uh, um, contrasting with the second tense sentence, which contains a topic, namely, comes after ich bin gut hirti, I'm a good shepherd, and the good shepherd is repeated here in topic position, in the initial position. Um, it has to be added that as an alternative to the pattern in one, the pattern in three is commonly found, which involves the verb second close with the sentence initial adverb do, der, huh? do was man in Jerusalem. There was a man in Jerusalem. Um, in contrast, the sentences expressing subordinating discourse relations like two, uh, I'm a good shepherd, good shepherd gives his soul for his sheep, um, which serve to introduce a hierarchical structure in the discourse, the patterns in one and three express coordinating relations, which indicate that the two discourse situations belong to the same level of discourse hierarchy as when in a typical narration, two situations occur in temporal segments. The verb second pattern was generalized with the help of the do verb second pattern, which has become a frequent alternative to the verb first pattern found in the oldest German text. So the idea here is that uh, a certain word order connected with a certain function, topicness, is exempted in order to express a syntactic configuration. The, verb second pattern found in German, in modern German. More in general, it's fairly well known that the quite free S of the order, uh, as is usually reconstructed for Proto-European, has given rise to the varied outcomes, for more or less rigid SVO in the Romance languages in English, rather rigid SOV and VSO respectively in most Anatolian and Celtic languages which are generally taken to result from the refunctionalization of certain patterns serving different pragmatic and syntactic functions, as for instance, focus, left, detachment, et cetera, et cetera. This is the key for understanding all these changes in terms of acceptation. A certain word order associated with a given pragmatic property, for instance, topichood, has been co-opted to endorse a precise syntactic function, for instance, subjecthood or in the perspective adopted here can be seen as pre-adapted to undertake the subsequent subsequence function. It has to be noted uh, in this connection that the fixation of word order is a controversial issue with these granularization studies. While in Meillet's seminal paper on granularization, word order fixation is listed among the classical instantiations of the phenomenon, later studies have argued that word order changes do not belong to the granularization because they do not share its basic character, namely a change from lexical to grammatical status, often via metaphoric or metonymic shifts, which are generally understood in terms of chains outlining the racial path as discussed above. In addition, it is important, very important, what other chains cannot be conceived as unidirectional. So they don't belong to the funnel shaped uh, model of gradualization. In fact, what other can change over time from a more rigid to a less rigid time or a more certain uh, from a certain order to its inverse order, for instance, add modifier to modify head. Spandrels, we have seen a number of acceptive changes uh, which can be accounted for in terms of pre adaptations. Can we find spandrels? Uh, namely, pure bricolage, in the sense that the extracted form cannot be seen as pre adapted for new function. I offer you a change, a phonological, well, a change uh, coming from a variety of French, the uh, Gersier French, uh, spoken in the islands in front of Great Britain, in which a plural marker R occurs in lexemes like laveu versus laveur, washer, washers, se versus sur, mm -hmm. sure, sures. Plural of sure adjective, which is due to the deletion 
of all final er unless followed by another later deleted consonant. So the change was from old French mer to je fais French mer, merc to je fais French mer, okay, which the final consonant is deleted. The f was prevented from deletion when followed by the plural marking s, which subsequently also underwent deletion. The remaining r found, for instance, in uh, in uh, mer uh, landmark was then accepted, namely reused as a plural marker instead of the earlier s, giving rise to a boundary shift. As a response, the phoneme deletion of logical boundary was moved leftwards, recreating the preceding root suffix schema. So mer, mer of old French became me, mer in Jersey French. Mm? So the air was re edited uh, here uh, as a plural marking uh, and subsequently extended to other nouns like se, sir, uh, elder trees, etc. This error cannot be seen as pre-adapted for new function by virtue of any particular property and qualifies as good candidate for being a spandrel. Let's move to, uh, since uh, I'm uh, already spoken something like 30, 45 minutes, let's move to the last part of my talk, which responds to, corresponds to the other uh, idea of looking back and uh, in the past and see how, what, uh, what kind of uh, proto-linguistic forms can we found, can we detect. Um, in this light, while the sketch dialectics between adaptive and adaptive changes can help us understand the factors of play in language change evolution, we can also attempt to use them in order to project our knowledge backwards into prehistoric times. Thus, principles like topic first or grams from lexemes, etc., can drive us to the reconstruction of a proto-linguistic stage. For Jackendorf, such a proto-linguistic substrate lies be below modern language, uh, namely the kind of cognitive scaffolding on which modern language is built, uh, similar to the basic variety suggested by um, a uh, famous paper by Klein and Perdue on uh, language uh, uh, acquisition. In this vein, we might also attempt a paleontology strip and look for relics of other language which happen to occur in modern languages in spite of their archaic character, very much like the panda stamp. And I will uh, try to explain, I will try to explain to you what I mean by stamp. One, my example is Latin ecce, which is a funny word, uh, uh, which has a clear origin in kind in morphological material, clear, well, let's say uh, 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 quite clear, uh, no uh, reconstruction in, in morphological material, namely the personal pronoun id uh, in Latin, uh, older form ed, and an eictic particle k here, you know, which is also found in other in other Latin words like keterus, etc. etc. Ecce is generally treated among the interjections, also, but it's also labeled as an adverb. It's generally used to address the attention of the listener, as in these three usages, in these three examples, deictic, deictic value, uh, textual value, and static value. Mm -hmm. Uh, note that in the first two usages, uh, ek uh, is, need not be integrated into the syntactic structure of the sentence, uh, stands alone, so to say, while in the static value, it is more integrated in the sense that you, it also governs a pronoun, an argument, so to say, ubi tu es, ek me. Hmm? From the original usage as an interjection, not really integrated in the sentence, develops a core usage around the static value, as I just said. And here you see a number of further uh, arguments, uh, syntactic arguments, depending on ecum, on ecke, which could also be inflected. So it acquires morphological uh, features, ecum presto militem, etc., etc., ecce tibis ebosus. Uh, note that, no, let me first say that 
what I mean by thetic value. I used the thetic in Hans Jürgen Zasse's uh, sense, namely, I oppose uh, thetic utterances to categorical utterances, while categorical utterances are biparted. Uh, bipartite predications involving a predication base, the entity about which is made in the predicate, which is something about the predication base, predicate positive constructions, uh, which involve a topical subject for Lambrecht. Thetic utterances are monomial predication. No argument is picked out as predication base. The entire situation, including all of its participants, is asserted as unitary whole. Uh, for Lambrecht, they are, uh, they are sentence focused constructions which involve a non topical subject. Let's go back in order to uh, realize that in the static values, namely these introduction of, of uh, reference to the, to, to, to the, the argument which is introduced, ecum militem, here is the soldier, uh, uh, we see there is a certain variation. The argument can be marked as accusative or as nominative. Ecce uh, tibi sebosus, here is sebosus. Uh. Uh, in this static construction, uh, ecke, despite its archaic form, begins to travel through the Latin things in the form of a static construction. And notice that uh, in, uh, older, in older cases, like uh, in the third, second century uh, AD, um, uh, BC, uh, ecke also displayed kind of inflection, uh, accusative inflection, basically echo, echoes, etc. Uh, in later, in classical Latin, uh, ecce goes back to its archaic form uh, without inflection. And as we said, uh, we already observed a conflict between accusative and nominative mar uh, marking, which has been resolved actually by Cicero uh, in favor of the nominative, uh, as you see here. Hmm? The, in, the NP governed by EK is marked by nominative. Okay. And you see a lot of cases from Latin to post Latin, which, as you see, as you see a number of further, uh, further syntactic uh, patterns become compatible with EK. Huh? Uh, uh, for instance, a dative. But also modifiers of the, uh, of the NP, Echenos, Tibis, Oboidientes, uh, and most importantly, sentential government. So, suddenly, in the course of time, in late Latin, uh, starting with Seneca, uh, first century uh, AD, we also find uh, sentence close, closes depending on Eche. Eche ut tolia Tibi ut posde consideratius loquaris. Eche. Quam miserum metu, etc., etc. Oh, how my woeful heart trembles with fear, etc., etc. Uh, let's go further and observe the development of Eke romance. Basically, uh, the funny thing is that Eke is only preserved in Italian, in Italian Eco, which is very similar to its ancestral, uh, uh, to, to, its, uh, to the Latin form Eke. All other Romance languages have lost uh, the uh, follower of, uh, of Ecke, although in old stages, remnants of, uh, of uh, these uh, followers uh, is, written, is witnessed, for instance, Old French as, as Le Vos, but also in Old Spanish, Old Catalan, etc. But they are lost in modern varieties with the uh, Funny exception, with a funny exception of French, and we'll come back to this funny exception uh, in a moment, uh, of a new form, voici voila, very famous form, which replaced the old form S found in old French, uh, with uh, basically with the same meaning, S le vos, old French, modern French, ou le voila. Uh, actually, resulting from an adaptive change, namely the grammaticalization of the verb voir, the imperative of the verb voir. Uh, see there, uh, deictic particle, la, there, okay? The funny thing is that Echo, uh, who is the follower, which is the follower of Latin Echo, Ecce, actually elaborates further the usages already found in Latin. Uh, and 
elaborate further also in the sense in the sense of expanding this usage in a number of other syntactic contexts. So we have presentative focus value, text of value, and discourse marked of value, as we observed in Latin. And the funny thing is that voila in French exactly uh, uh, correspond or reproduce the same functions, although voila consists of completely different material, hmm? morphological material. So this usage, usage cannot be said to be inherited by voila in a strict sense. Uh, if we look at, at, the, uh, at the syntactic context, which echo and voila occurs, we can distinguish a number of possibilities of increasing complexity. I will not review them in detail because we need too much time. But as you see, we start with the simple introduction of a direct object, uh, the noteworthy uh, government of an infinitive, which is not was not possible in Latin, and also the past participle. And finally, also external syntax in the sense that echo can be included in the in a depending dependent clause. Mm -hmm. To give you one idea, uh, the red examples are Italian, the blue examples are French, they are completely parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the example which was not possible in Latin uh, with an infinitive governed by echo. Uh, ecco lo prendere, lui voilà prendre sa place. Uh, ecco venire Pietro, voilà venir Pierre. But also with the possible. Ecco arrivato il momento, voilà arrivé le moment, etc. etc. Note that this expansion is not casual, uh, follow, uh, follows a number of, uh, of uh, a certain pattern. For instance, anergative verbs are not compatible uh, with this extension. Ecco la dormita sul sofa, la vola dormi sulle canapé is not possible. I have no time to elaborate on this now. And as I said, um, uh, as I said, uh, ecco and voila also uh, can also be used in uh, subordinate clauses. For instance, personne dit que voila une situation facile. Uh, no one is saying that this is an easy situation. Uh, or with causal, uh, with the causal sentences, uh, uh, car voilà un acte qui l'aurait normalement délégué à l'infirmière, uh, perché ecco arrivare il giocatore che tutte le teenagers stavano attendendo, this is the red one is Italian, the blue one is French, and also in relative sentences. Reconnaîtrais-tu la personne dont voici la photo? Noi cominceremo con la cabala della quale ecco esposta la suddivisione. Uh. To sum up, amazing stability of Latin ec and of its Italian follower echo. Hmm? If we calculate uh, keeping intact its original static value, hmm? it covers more than two millennia, which is really impressive. Since the early beginnings, its staticity is strictly connected with initial sentence position, a low degree of word level categoriality, lack of any morphological trait in Latin it acquired some kind of uh, morphological inflection, uh, accusative marking, ecum, etc. It was lost subsequently. Develop development of a wide range of verbal characters relating to its internal external syntax, syntax as a static predicate, tremendously expanded in Italian. A long standing datic and textual usages already present in Latin, where echo was scarcely integrated into syntax and still active in modern Italian. And ostensive functions serving as focus markers, similar to Latin. As I just said, uh, it's not worthy uh, to observe that uh, in old Italian, we first find cases where echo governs an infinitive or a past participle, echo verso noi venir per nave. Here's an old man, uh, un vecchio. Here's an old man coming toward us by, Dan uh, by boat. This is Dante hmm? Alighieri. Ecco giunta con la cane pareggia. Uh, is intended the death. He has come the one who makes uh, makes us all equal to the death. So, uh, if we consider that we found exactly the same pattern in voila in French voila, we find we have faced we are faced with an historical conundrum. Given the different diachronic origin of echo and voila, how can we explain their tight construction correspondence? Did voila fill the functional space previously occupied by all the French S? 
Uh, if it is so, should we then conclude that S behaves similar to old Italian echo? And then, as in a kind of uh, uh, in a push chain, uh, did voila force this appearance of S in a kind of push chain? This is a reasonable explanation. Against this explanation, this account, we can we could think that uh, the uh, the occurrence of S in old French is so limited that uh, that it's quite unplausible that. Uh, this construction was so developed and expanded as we observe in old Italian, where echo is very, very uh, pervasive. But on the other hand, if the development of voila is totally independent of S, did it evolve in accordance with, for instance, an idealized cognitive model a la, a la George Lekov, centered around a basic value of, of pointing uh, as a presentational uh, as, a, as, a, as for presentational constructions, yeah? uh, very very basic in terms of cognitive uh, salience. Or should we rather assume a sort of drift which might have guided the development of voila and echo from above? Yeah? So the explanation kind of deep drift. What I would like to suggest to you here, and I will leave you with this suggestion is a kind of proto-linguistic explanation. Proto-language is only rudimentary grammatical structure governed by very simple principles. Jack and Off, Jack and Off lease, uh, uh, intends a system which words can be concatenated indefinitely, but in a manner of a shopping list. The proto-language has phonology, but it has little or no consistent structure, no recursion, no subordination, no functional categories. The semantic relation among words are signaled by word order alone using the full principles such as agent first, focus last, Modify agent to modify adjacent to modified, etc. Since all combinatoriality is driven by phonology and semantics, there is no need for words to be categorized by parts of speech. If one accepts these premises, which uh, the, then one also has to consider the intriguing possibility uh, that the courage is not complete, that there exist pockets of modal language as relics of early stages of the language capacity. This is again Jack and Bob. And these relics would be areas where there is only rudimentary grammatical structure in which such grammatical structure as there is uh, does not so much to shape semantic interpretation. In this perspective, ec an Italian echo, uh, might represent the survivor of, uh, of a proto-linguistic fossil, namely a primary pr primitive cognitive scaffolding governed by very simple principles like focus last, and particular salient in the face-to-face -face communication thanks to its ostensive function. On the other hand, ecche and, and Italian echo is partially integrated into the sentential structure in a way, however, which clearly shows its archaic profile. For instance, it refuses any kind of word categorization. Is it an adverb? Is it an adjection? Is it a verb? Good question. Like the pandas thumb, it's not really a verb, although it has developed a certain number of verbal properties. In addition, this relic is a success story to the extent that the similar development is observed in voila, which displays fully different substance, substance but similar functional properties. Might this be due to its role as a primary cognitive scaffolding, namely this scaffolding which underlies our our very very basic cognitive abilities as also advocated by uh, the idealized cognitive models a la George Lekov, hmm? this pointing model. I leave you with this question and I come to, quickly to the conclusion. Adopting an evolutionary perspective allows us to understand language change with the help of a general concepts like plasticity and economy of a system which speakers play a central role as actors in the change. In particular, we could develop a distinction between adaptive and acceptive changes, where the latter are partially distinct from the former to the extent that they have P of a more limited reach, we call the bricoler's craft of Roger Less. Moreover, the evolutionary perspective is also of help to understand the parabola of certain examples which despite their bizarre nature are surprisingly stable and even reinforced by means of language change, as we have seen with Ecke, Echo and French Voila. From the paleontologist's perspective, this cannot be accidental. Rather, it must be the survivor of a proto-linguistic relics fossilized in modern structure, but optimally serving the original aesthetic, namely ostensive function. 
and I thank you for your observation, for your attention. Thank you so much, Livio, for such an enlightening talk. Uh, I will, uh, I have some questions. So uh, one of them is not actually a question, it's more, uh, I was wondering about the role of spandrels, which is, which seemed quite difficult to identify. And I was wondering whether uh, these linking elements that we find in compounds could serve as some type mm -hmm. of spandrels when we have uh, these compounds clipped. So imagine a stem-based compounds and we have these linking elements like O normally in Romans languages. And then when we clip these compounds and we have just the first stem with the O uh, uh, linking vowel, this linking vowel turns, ends up acquiring a grammatical value, which it's uh, in a way could be uh, described as a word class. So would you consider that mm -hmm. would this also serve as, as, a, as a spandrel in, a, in the way that you are defining or reinterpreting the idea of uh, adaptation, acceptation, and spandrels in, in your system? Well, thank you very much for the question. Actually, it's a, it's a good point in the sense that uh, we might try to oppose this kind of element that you find it, and you also find them in several languages, including Romance languages, Italian, for instance, huh? uh, in which we, you find, for instance, like, uh, things like, like aspirino dipendente, aspirina, mm -hmm. Dependente, you find aspirino dependent with this O as a linking element, and uh, which is fun, which is funny because, well, as you know, Italian usually do not have uh, right-headed compounds, so they are already funny. <laughs> and uh, in addition, you also find this linking element. Uh, actually, this might be a spandrel in the sense that there is nothing in this O which might figure out kind of pre-adaption for this linking uh, function in contrast to the linking elements, which we know from Germanic languages, which used to be genitive marker, tages uh, ordnung. Uh, they are pre-adapted in a, in a way because they were genitive marker. And you know, and we know that genitives usually express these uh, modifying function, this, this bounding, bound, um, uh, this connection between nouns actually. No, this is the main function of genitive. So we might oppose this kind of uh, new linking element found in aspirino dependente to uh, tages ordnung or jahres uh, sammlung uh, found in German and in many other Roma uh, Germanic languages, where they might uh, be interpreted in terms of uh, pre-adaptions, not spandrel, because they were pre-adapted for the function. But Anyway, thank you for the question. So it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> uh, I never thought about it, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I, 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 so I, I read the, uh, the abstract for your talk and I immediately uh, thought about spandrels. So maybe would, would we be able to find spandrels in, in these systems? And then uh, that's just a suggestion. And uh, I was also- uh, Actually, my other, the other favorite, uh, my other favorite spandrel is burger. This uh. kind of- uh, like cheeseburger, et cetera, because this is pure reanalysis of uh, lexical stuff, uh, very much in the bricolers uh, sense of Roger Les, because of course, burger in, in, in sense of, uh, of bread <laughs> has nothing to do with the original uh, etymology of a hamburger, et cetera. So this is a real spandrel. Okay, Indeed. anyway, I... <laughs> Interrupted you? <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 it's it's great. Um, I was also uh, would I, I think it's more a cl uh, clarification question regarding the idea mm -hmm. of function, which is fundamental when we're talking about adaptation and acceptation. And I was wondering whether uh, shouldn't we consider function uh, related to a particular level of analysis in terms of function in phonology, function in morphology? Because I, I know that it, so as a first approximation to your uh, talk, I thought that acceptation and adaptation would bear some sort of a more femic content. Then we could assign some sort of, 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 of function to it. And then the phonological level mm -hmm. would be much more structural in a way that you assign to some, some, some segments a particular function. Uh, but I know that that is totally different from what uh, you were initially claiming. So my, my question is, 
uh, would it be possible or is it reasonable to consider function related to a particular uh, level, like a function in phonology, function in a morphology, or function intra levels, like a, a, a moving from a, a, a phonology to a morphology, and etc.? Uh, maybe it's, a, I don't know, uh, it would be interesting for you to explore a little bit more the idea of function. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, as you know, I mean, the, the word function is awful in the sense that there are yeah. so many possible interpretations of function that it's better to avoid it anyway. But anyway, uh, this is the reason why I try to give you examples drawn from different uh, linguistic levels uh, of adaptation, of, of adaptive changes and of exaptive changes, because I wanted to, do, to, to give you an idea of the, of the reach of this uh, conceptual uh, underpinning, as, uh, as you want to understand in these terms, uh, in the different levels. So facing with different problems, so structural problems, because of course, phonological changes uh, are, uh, well, presuppose a number of, uh, of factors, articulation, perception, etc., which are only partially active, also morphological change or syntactic change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, um, independence of the single, the different linguistic levels, different aspects play a role or different functions play a role. My idea was to, and this is the reason why I really started thinking about it after reading the paper by Lindblom and collaborator, to, to uh, adopt their understanding of the what and of the how mode, mm -hmm as responsible for the change, uh, for the adaptive change, uh, because this is a crucial part of the story. Uh, because as, ma as many others, I, uh, I, I think, uh, I was struck reading uh, Annick Anderson's paper of 73 and this abduction idea of uh, change in which the, the, the speaker to the listener turns speaker uh, acts the change, is the, the subject of the change, the actor of the change, uh, because of the misinterpretation of the of the output of the first speaker, but I I ask myself all the time, but why, uh, why the second speaker doesn't simply correct <laughs> the mistake of the first speaker, <laughs> and this double modality is the crucial story of the adaptive changes. So as speakers, we are probably able to adapt uh, our way of un in interpreting uh, the, the, uh, the uh, linguistic signal that we uh, uh, perceive in dependence of a number of uh, environment, uh, contextual factors. Uh? And if the contextual factors require uh, that we adapt ourselves to the change, then we adopt the how mode and not what mode. So do we change do we change our our understanding of of uh, producing uh, the speech signal uh, in accordance with the requirements of the context? And I think this is the the factor which unifies uh, the different linguistic levels: phonology, morphology, syntax, etc. This idea of interpreting in terms of how mode and what mode. But of course, different functions have to be assumed for the different linguistic levels. And actually, I wanted to elaborate more on that. On this, try to uh, find more examples also of an acceptive, uh, of acceptive changes in which uh, we can show very well that, um, that acceptive changes relate to um, a domain which is uh, similar in a certain extent to adaptive changes, but also uh, essentially different in terms of the reach of the, of the teleology, would say, of the change. For instance, take the what other changes. I mean, uh, interpreting what other changes in terms of acceptive changes is very, is very challenging in the sense that <laughs> that already Meillet uh, intended that the, the fixed word order of Romance language is a kind of organization. Uh, of course, uh, it's part of the grammar of French or of Italian that the order SBO is obligatory. Uh, but is this a grammaticalization in in, in the same sense, I would say no, this is an acceptation, namely the refunctionalization of a certain order coming uh, used to serve pragmatic functions, uh, refunctionalized in a new way. So it's a, a, an acceptation instead of a grantalization. But as I said, I mean, I have to find more examples on that, but I'm working on a book, I have to say. <laughs> 
looking forward to read that. Uh, uh, we have a, we have a we have a, um, a, a question in our chat. Uh, Lahlan Lahlan Mackenzie is asking. Oh. you mentioned yeah, you mentioned that Haspomat characterized the initial state of the elements that undergo grammaticalization as deliberate. Would this threaten your rejection as of what? the teleology? Uh, uh, as what? Uh, as grammaticalization, so under so uh, characterize the initial state of the elements that undergo grammaticalization as deliberate. Would this uh, deliberate, in your okay. rejection, of, yeah, of teleology? No, no, in the sense that uh, what Martin has not, I mean, this is my understanding of what Martin wrote, uh, is that uh, deliberate means uh, used with a lexical meaning, with reference. A lexical reference, so to say. So, in sense, in this, and since they are used with lexical reference, they can be um, used in different constructions. They are not uh, connected, uh, tied with a specific construction. This is the point. Huh? Simply because they are free, in the sense they are free to refer huh? to to to. Um, to uh, entities, in the sense they are not fixed in a certain construction. Okay, this is the usage of deliberate. I think, but I thank Lachlan uh, for for this. <laughs> and a final question: So there is a conjunction in linguistic comparative works indicating that their methods cannot reach beyond ten thousand years. So how do the conceptual pair of the adaptation acceptation provide us tools to go beyond this time limit and identify proto linguistic stages? Good question. <laughs> well, uh, of course, we are talking about uh, idealizations because we simply don't know. We have no uh, concrete evidence. No? We only have evidence that we can either see or reconstruct uh, uh, on the base of what we see. But it's surely striking to discuss, to, 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 to look into these cases like Latin echo or Italian echo because it's really amazing that you find exactly the same structure uh, preserved until today, replicated in French in exactly the same functions <laughs> and still retaining this archaic character in the sense of being unspecified in terms of word category uh, without any kind of morphological markers not fully integrated into syntax, et cetera, et cetera. So all things that you might imagine to belong to proto-language. <laughs> so, and this is really striking. So I, I'm not claiming that, that this is the whole story, but it's trying to observe that these cases are found and this can give us an idea uh, of a flavor uh, of what a proto-linguistic stage can be uh, or must have been. Uh, in this sense. So it's, of course, very tentative, but this is the, the, the attempt, actually. Okay. Thank you so much, Livio, for such an enlightening and amazing talk. I really enjoyed watching uh, and, and uh, learning with you today and uh, learning from you today. And uh, uh, now I'm looking forward to reading your book. Uh, so please uh, so keep us posted about, you know, the developments of your writing. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've been reading your work for years and uh, I'm really glad that I, I managed to meet you at least remotely this time. And uh, so I thank you so much on behalf of a Berlin, of a, on behalf of my fellow linguists here in Brazil. And uh, I hope that we can meet sometime soon uh, when the situation gets better. Yeah. I, I thank you for inviting me to participate in this initiative, this enterprise. I would also like to come to Brazil and I hope to meet you. <laughs> and when, uh, above all, I hope that this uh, terrible infection will, will leave us all safe and healthy and will pass soon. <laughs> so we hope, we hope to, to, to be in a new world on, or, or to be back in the, our old world in the next month after summer. Anyway, <laughs> take care and, and I hope we'll keep in touch. Fingers crossed. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much and uh, see you in the next opportunity. And, and, and thank you for everybody who is watching us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.